Hello and welcome to Storyboard. I'm Shibani Gharat. If you are a marketer or a student of marketing, then you might know your marketing management textbook at the back of your hand. Pearson India recently launched the 16th edition of its marketing management textbook. The book is in line with the dynamic environment inhabited by today's marketers and offers a distinctive perspective for readers to understand the changing global marketplace and the impact of technology on making strategic marketing decisions. The book in its 16th edition features a lot of interesting case studies, theoretical insights compiled by gurus in marketing and in this storyboard special, I am catching up with them. Joining me in this conversation, I have Professor Philip Kotler, Kevin Lane Keller, Alexander Chernov, Jagdish N. Seth and G. Shainesh. From them, I am finding out how is the new thinking in the field of marketing being reflected in the latest edition of Marketing Management what has changed and what has stayed consistent over time and how has the pandemic fundamentally changed the role of marketing function and much more. How are the new dynamics in the field of marketing being reflected, uh, you know, in the latest edition of marketing management and what has really changed, what has stayed consistent? Yes, it turns out that uh, marketing is always changing. And yet it doesn't lose its first principles. For example, uh, we will continue to think that marketing is going to be customer centric. By the way, I want to add employee centric too, but that's a further development. And uh, we will always uh, think of uh, markets from the point of view that they are very complicated. Mm. We have to segment, target, and position <clears throat> ourselves and be careful about choosing the right market to be in. And also we have to use some form of the four Ps. It could be the five, seven Ps. It doesn't have to be Ps, but that in planning your program, you have to talk about product, price, place, and promotion, purpose, people, if you want. Every company has to shape its variables that it believes have an impact on the customer's purchase rate. So, um, but the big revolution is the um, digital revolution and the use of AI, which has ch completely changed. Uh, if someone says to me, and it already happened, I'm a CEO, I've used your book all the time. Uh, I have the first edition, would you sign it? I said, no, I won't sign it because <laughs> You can't practice 1967 marketing in the year 2022. So they they get the point. They said, oh, you're trying to sell me a new copy. And I say, yes, of course, but for your good, because marketing has moved uh, up many, many levels. Marketing management is something that gave the world four Ps. But now, you know, according to this uh, 16th edition, uh, the seven T marketing uh, mix represents a more refined version of the four P framework, which was there in uh, marketing management, which has been used for so many years. Physical first, people are thinking digital first now. Hmm. They first go to the laptop to search for information. They go to the laptop for shopping behavior, for example. And if necessary, they want to go to physical places nowadays. So brick and mortar is becoming secondary and digital is becoming primary, flipping the previous notion. <clears throat> For the Indian context, there is one more major change. Mm -hmm. And that is the new consumer now is very young. The biggest outsourcing in India is not in the IT companies mm -hmm. or IT services companies, but it is at home. Mm -hmm. The next generation of consumers don't know how to cook, clean, or take care of the child. The biggest outsourcing is eating out or bringing food in, for example. Mm -hmm. Biggest outsourcing is uh, uh, having maid service or some, even for middle class, which is generating an enormous shift from product to services economy. Mm -hmm. For an emerging economy, surprisingly, Indian economy is a lot more services oriented economy. Mm -hmm. That's the second one. Mm -hmm. uh, the third element in the Indian context besides demographics is that it is truly globalizing mm. through social media on the one hand, mm. but more importantly, 
all foreign companies are now operating in a significant way in India, especially Korean companies. So if you look at the Samsungs of the world in appliances, not just in cell phones, if you look at the LG, for example, look at the Hyundai, South Korean brands dominate in India, as do, in fact, for example, the uh, Whirlpool of America, Electrolux, etc. So competition is no longer local, local only, but competition is global at the same time. Yeah. And Indian companies have to learn how to market in a globalizing India in many ways, rather than India being a domestic economy per se. Uh, Professor Keller, uh, one of the highlights of the book Marketing Management and which I personally would find extremely useful uh, while reading the book as a student was the kind of examples that you know the book had. Uh, the global examples, some of the cases, some of the brands that I as a student haven't, hadn't even heard of were a part of uh, you know, uh, the book when I was studying. So can you share with us what does it really take to come up and research these kind of examples and what do you look at you know, when uh, you, know, you look at uh, uh, these examples from a brand success uh, you know, uh, point of view? So we're always scanning and looking for what are the interesting, you know, what are the interesting marketing and interesting companies and brands? What are they doing? What's working? Maybe what's not working that we can then share. And it helps, I think, to bring a life. And, and especially um, as Jag was talking about with the South Korean brands, I mean, it's a global landscape. So you really do want to look all over the world and try to find it. That said, it's great for the local markets. And like India, for example, one of the reasons that book, I think, has been so successful is how it's been able to highlight you know, those brands that maybe we don't know about that are yet are so many good lessons. So I think that's the, the spirit of the book that we've always tried to retain. And again, th thanks to all the uh, all of us, you know, we kind of work on it collectively to do that. If you can share with us, how has, you know, this entire pandemic fundamentally changed the role of a marketer, marketing function and the way to market products? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, a, that's a great question. And I'm actually going to, I'll start it and then I'm going to hand it off to my co-authors because I think there's a lot of different points to make here. But I, I, I think it kind of comes back to, again, what, one, what was both Phil and Jag were saying, the digital revolution, it kind of accelerated it. And mobile especially, I think the mobile technologies, and, and there's differences when you talk about digital and the whole online, there's been a, a whole another shift as we go into mobile now, which is gonna be really interesting going forward. So that changed, omni-channel became such a big deal. So companies really had to learn how to sell and, and distribute their products and supply chain and all of that in, in, in ways that they really you know, never had before. And the other interesting thing, I, you know, the, um, when you think of the core of marketing, it always has customer there, but it's always value. It's always about how does what you create value, you know, deliver value, communicate value. So the question in the pandemic, people's views on value changed some in terms of what, how they, you know, the kind of value they wanted and could get. So I think certain industries benefited, obviously, mm -hmm. in certain markets, you know, going forward. But I think that part of it, I, I, you know, and how the consumer maybe views value in 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 how they're now learning from others digitally, I think was probably the thing that got really accelerated um, in the pandemic. Uh, you can add on to this, uh, Professor Shainesh. In fact, you know, in the pandemic, we saw uh, many new age businesses becoming big spenders, uh, you know, edutech platforms, for example, quick service picking up, uh, you know, in a big way. We saw the kind of, uh, you know, push that digital uh, got in the country. So, uh, how do you think marketing, marketing function uh, and the role of marketing function has evolved, uh, you know, after the two years of pandemic? Okay, so, you know, this was also the time when we were working on the book, Adaptation. Mm -hmm. uh, so among the 60 odd examples that we have actually put together for the book, uh, we were conscious of the fact. So uh, Professor Kotler's book was my textbook in 1992 when I was a student in IM Bangalore. Uh, eighth edition, I still have a copy of that. Uh, no, while he says it's not relevant, it's absolutely relevant even today. Uh, so one of the things that when I and Dr. Shade discussed, we said we had to move a lot more from packaged goods focus, you know, consumer products, we call us yes. FSD or 
package goods. So we have lots of examples of services. Uh, then again, we moved from a lot of large businesses, small businesses, so startups and small businesses and services uh, and B2B. So we brought all of those examples. I'll give you very quickly three examples which really leveraged digital during the pandemic. One is a very traditional company, Titan and Tanishk. Yeah. Uh, that's the time when people are not going to the retail outlets to buy jewelry, but weddings were happening, functions were happening. People wanted to buy jewelry. So they created this whole concept of an endless aisle. Yeah. It means that you, know, you can call up the outlet, yeah. see the jewelry that's available, and you have a wedding in Chennai, yeah. uh, but you're from Bengal and you want some traditional Bengal design, and they would source it from the outlet in Calcutta and send it to you. That's narrated in the book. That's one example. A startup was born in uh, during the pandemic uh, by a friend Plate, who founded a company called Plato. It's a shoe company, uh, shoes for kids, uh, for growing feet. Uh, and this was launched during the pandemic. And the founder and the co-founders worked for Nike for almost 20 years. And they did everything digitally from consumer insights, understanding the product design, to distributing and fairly successful in less than a year. The third one is a traditional retailer, Landmark Group, Max, uh, you know, Spar, and a whole bunch of other brands as part of the Landmark Group. Uh, they created apps, they created uh, digital uh, solutions, so that, remember that retail stores were still functional, especially the supermarkets. So when people go to the stores, the stocks may not be available. And you don't want to disappoint them. So they had these apps which allowed people to actually place the order, pick up what is available, and then the rest of it gets delivered home. So businesses really accelerated the adoption of digital. Because if you have physical stores, you're sort of reluctant to invest in that. But when you don't have a choice, you actually accelerate to those investments. Yeah. And all these stories are obviously narrated there. The startups like InMobi or you know, Big Basket, all of them are chapter openers. Now my next question to you, uh, Professor Chernev, uh, how has the role of a brand evolved after so many years? Especially the, the big brands that are out there, the global big brands, big companies, big spenders. There are several things about, uh, first, uh, let's step back. Um, when you talked about the four Ps and the, uh, uh, why we need to rethink the four Ps. And one of the reasons is kind of the brand is not one of the four Ps. So then how do we manage it? It's not part of the product. So this separation between products and brands has continued. And now brands actually stand for something more than just describing the, the qualities of the product. And um, part of that is um, brands more and more reflect the changes in the social sociocultural environment that exists. And um, this is one dramatic change when brands uh, stand for something. They've begun more and more standing. Uh... Welcome back. And we are continuing our conversation with Professor Philip Kotler, Kevin Lane Keller, Alexander Chernov, Jagdish and Seth, and Jishanesh. Earlier, they spoke about how four Ps have now changed to 70s. Moving on, let's find out more from these gurus about how this ever-evolving marketing function is taking a new shape. Next question to you, Professor Kotler. Uh, you know, we have, uh, many of us have often discussed in the past couple of months, couple of years, how, uh, let's say, the role of a CMO um, is diminishing or changing. And, you know, a CMO has almost become a, a dying breed. But uh, what will be the role of marketing uh, in the coming years? Most companies still look for the CMO, and they should, and I'll tell you why. The CMOs have performed the, uh, a fraternity. Hmm. They now see each other regularly. Hmm. They are writing articles for each other. Hmm. They, are, um, th they are advancing their collective understanding of the role of marketing. Now, you have to understand that for years, marketing was separated from innovation. Mm. Uh, and they, a company would have some product development people put, on, put out some new version mm. without marketing participating very actively or if at all. And the job of marketing was, okay, now we have the new car, sell it. And then, of course, marketing people would say, increasingly, the price is too high. How did you ever figure that anyone's going to buy it at that price? And uh, the quotas are, are ridiculous. 
that you set. We can't sell that number and so on. And then certain features are missing. Okay. So the end result was that finally, the, the whole idea of not the vice president of marketing, but the idea of the chief marketing officer, CMO, was to make that person, him or her, part of the whole strategy team and coming in not only on the question of how to shape the new product, but what new product should we be creating? In fact, if you go back to Peter Drucker, his point was that the aim of marketing is to make selling unnecessary. My God, what does he mean by that? The aim of marketing is to innovate, basically. Innovate, meet new needs, meet needs that are not satisfied. And then when the customers with those needs note this product coming out, they just stand in line and place an order. You don't even need salesmen. We go from originally selling Coca-Cola as a mass marketing thing for everyone with no differentiation and one message only, happiness or whatever. Then we go into segments. All right. Even at McDonald's today, there are several plans. A plan for how do you get more teenagers to go to McDonald's. A separate plan for how do you get mothers with children who are single to go to McDonald's. So we are getting very more, very micro, but not only micro, very micro, down to having information on each person, what that person who might be buying our product consumes as media, where they shop, what their wishes are, and so on. 4% of all the IT budgets in the company now is no longer with CIO, Chief Information Officer, but it is with the chief marketing officer who has no competence yeah. because they're not trained in digital marketing at all. Mm -hmm. They still rely on the old ad agencies who are either are print experts or broadcast experts mm -hmm. or cable experts now. So mm -hmm. there's a mismatch there. Mm -hmm. The second point is, as I think Kevin mentioned, uh, Alex mentioned, Phil mentioned, Shainus mentioned, all of us mentioned, role of chief marketing officer is more holistic now. Mm -hmm. It is not just to support the brand or the sales organization through advertising, branding, mm -hmm. but to serve purpose, to look into internal marketing, which is the employee marketing, for example. And because of that, we believe the struggle is to call chief growth officer, chief revenue officer, or much more than that. Mm -hmm. My own recommendation has been that the marketing should become to separate from the sales organization even a staff function, not a line function. Mm. Just as we have the chief financial officer, mm. we have a chief legal officer, mm. it should be in that category. So basically as a staff function, it is much more coordination, communication, cooperation, et cetera, across all divisions. I yeah. wanted to ask a question before we yeah. move on. Uh, yes. Because something said by uh, uh, Professor Sheth is very controversial, mm. uh, that it should be a, uh, a staff function. Mm. Uh, most companies, CEOs look at their CMO and they say, what has marketing contributed mm. to market share and profits? Yeah. If you make it a line function, if you make it a staff function, that, that's an absurd question. Or are you talking about both of them happening that while it is a staff function, marketing should be asked the question, what have you done to, uh, to help our profitability? How would you answer that? Uh, actually, in many ways, as uh, the HR people ask the same question, if you're a chief human resource officer, question is how are you delivering the bottom line? when you are actually more a cost center. So the question would be again in HR function, do you automate? How do you automate? Do you use technology like uh, AI as an enabler to get more out of your one employee, for example? I'm a very strong believer that technology can actually make a human more superhuman in many ways. Kinds of things that he or she could not do can be done now, can be more versatile in many ways. So what's the role of HR, therefore, 
is to say, how do I deliver efficiency and effectiveness using my manpower primarily as a resource, as opposed to brand as my resource, as opposed to product as my resource. So there's a comparability. Yeah. You look at the legal function as sitting on the boards of large companies, this is exactly what happens. Conspicuous absence 